our second seminar of the semester. Um, today's uh, seminar is going to feature our new faculty. They're going to tell you a little bit about their interests. Uh, if there's time at the end, I'll tell you a little bit about what's new in our EE program, but if there's no time at the end, that's okay too. The main thing is, is that our, our new faculty get a chance to, to talk. So that, that means we each have about 15 minutes or, or 20 at, at the absolute most. Um, our first speaker today, oh, and let me finish the administration. You're probably familiar with this. Midway through the talk, we'll start passing it around, if, and, and if you're here, please sign in, and this will count towards one of your seminars this semester. Um, okay, I think that's all the administration. All right, our first speaker is uh, Professor Mario Garcia Sanz. He's joined us in January, I believe. At the, at the end of January, yeah. Okay. Um, from the University of Navarra in Pamplona, Spain. He's a specialist in complex multivariable nonlinear control systems and he's been devoting himself to wind energy over the last few years. And Mario, please. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Good with this light, oh, or maybe we can. Good. Is that good? It's good for you. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, Steve. Uh, it's a pleasure for me, you know, to introduce today my research. Um, well, we are starting a new group that is the Advanced Control Energy Systems and a Spacecraft Group. Um, I am at the department in the all in 605 so I will be very happy anyway you know if you have any question or you want to visit me you know in my office so all in 605 and uh, you know we can talk about these particular things that I am going to introduce you if you like well because I have only 15 minutes let's go on to 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 talk a little bit about my research areas, my main interest. Um, well, in my area of research is mainly about control. Uh, so it's advanced control and applied to many different applications. In particular, industrial applications, uh, first of all, energy applications, environmental, spacecraft, things like that. So what is a, um, control? What is advanced control? So suppose that you have a wind turbine here and you want to control automatically many different things like uh, the power that you are producing, the energy that you are producing, or you want to control you know, the, um, some movements like the, the pitch angle, the rotor speed, and you want to attenuate the mechanical loads of the system, you want to uh, to produce a very good energy in terms of quality, like uh, um, voltage and frequency uh, in, the, in the grid, that means uh, active and reactive power in the grid. And you have to deal with uh, the wind that is random, can be very strong. Uh, we are talking about multi-megawatt machines, and we have to deal also with many different things in the grid. So you have, at the end, your windmill in the middle, and you have you know, to, to put the energy into the grid, but you have also you know, the wind that is changing, and maybe you have this system in the middle of, of nowhere or, and, and has, to be, or has to work automatically. Maybe it's an onshore or it's an offshore that is uh, uh, you know, in the middle of the lake here, Lake Erie, or in the middle of the North Sea, and then you have also currents, and you, know, you have many things around the system. <coughs> and the system has to be reliable. The system has to work alone. The system has to be very efficient in terms of energy. So we need many sensors here, you know, in terms of uh, position, speed, acceleration, forces, power, voltages, current, the temperature, many different things. And we need uh, actuators. So we have to move the blades, the pitch angle of the blades, we have to move the jaw, we have to move uh, or to control the IGBTs, we have to control many things. And then we have the feedback. So we are looking at the sensors, knowing what is going on, and then 
we have to design a control strategy to put in the computer to move the actuators that are actuating in the system. So this is my uh, area of uh, research. How to design these algorithms, these control algorithms, in order to be able to improve the efficiency of the system, uh, the reliability of the system, and to be able, you know, to survive in, in the middle of nowhere, you know, for more than 20 years. So uh, we have to, to understand the system, we have to understand how to design the controllers in order to, uh, you know, mm, uh, to be very good in terms of the mechanical fatigue, in terms of the, uh, um, um, any situation that you can have in the system. Then we can put here a windmill, or we can put here a spacecraft, or we can put here a wastewater treatment plant, or anything. Because control is very wide. It's about you know, how to design these controllers with some mathematical structures, some uh, mathematical algorithms, and some methodologies. Uh, that will be able, you know, to fulfill the specifications for this particular application. So, um, this is the main area: is uh, robust control in general. That means, you know, algorithms that can work in many different situations for real-world applications. And uh, and this is about math. This is about uh, algorithms. This is about uh, uh, differential equations. About control. And. Uh, and then this is the, the big picture, you know, we have to know the stability, we have to, to know how to uh, put the system in, in the conditions that we like, how to reject disturbances and things like that. So we are developing new control theory for new applications, in particular wind energy, but other applications. This is the first point. The second point, we have to understand the systems. So we are bridging the gap between theory and real world applications. So we have to be very good here in new control theory, but we have also to understand very well you know, what is going on in our real applications and going back and forth from the theory to the real application. This is more or less you know, the big picture of my uh, re research. So we are working in uh, a couple of areas. It's a robust control, quantitative feedback theory control. We have been developing many new uh, methodologies for many different applications in the past, and also for you know uh, with using nonlinear switching control. That is a, an, another very interesting technique for uh, complex applications, and we are using this for energy, so wind energy, uh, in particular with uh, multi-megawatt wind turbines. I have been working for companies for many years in Europe, designing controllers that are right now working in the, in, you know, in the field, in the mountains, in onshore, uh, some offshore. And uh, the second area is space, spacecraft control, and then also environmental and industrial applications. So let me show you just some pictures. This is just about, you know, uh, to give you a first idea about my research. This is a project that we did some years ago for, with a jet propulsion laboratory in uh, NASA in California. It's about how to control the relative distance between or among many, or a, you know, a, um, a set of a spacecraft working together with telescopes. So, uh, and the, the, the main uh, uh, project was how to design the controllers to do this task. Is a is the Planet Finder mission? It's a very demanding mission. It's a very hot topic right now in uh, at NASA JPL. This is another example that was for the European Space Agency. It's three spacecraft working very far away. This is five million kilometers. You know, you can understand. You know, the distance between the Moon and, and the Earth is only three hundred thousand kilometers, and we are talking about five thousand kilometers with a precision of nanometers. This is just to know. Um, you know, to try to understand the gravitational waves. Well, that was very demanding in terms of control. So you have to design very, very demanding uh, or very complex algorithms to reject, you know, here the um, the gravitational waves or the, you know, the solar pressure and things like that. This is another one also for ESA that was, this is the first um, Formation flying mission of ESA and uh, is about two spacecraft working together in a very elliptic orbit 
and the, the task was how to control the relative distance between these two spacecraft that are moving in this very elliptic orbit. So it's quite non-linear, you know the behavior. And uh, the objective for this was to see the solar corona, so you know, to, to understand that. This is another one about how to coordinate two controllers, two uh, spacecraft, one in a very low F Earth orbit, elliptic orbit as well, and the other one geostationary. So this is going very fast, many times every, every day, and this is just, you know, one orbit per day with the Earth. So the connection between this, we, we, we use here nonlinear switching control and things like that. This is another one for, this is the uh, Darwin mission, very interesting mission, with a spacecraft, with satellites, in order to look for exoplanets. That's very, very demanding, and we develop new control theory to deal with a, a multivariable, multi-input, multi-output problem, but with flexible modes, because we have a shield that, uh, you know, is, uh, we have some kind of vibration that we have to reject, and we have a telescope here to look very far away in that formation. Um, another project, this is more, this is just in the Earth, is a wash water treatment plant. Uh, very non-linear anyway, very interesting as well. And the thing is, was how to control, you know, different, uh, uh, the concentration of ammonia and nitrates in, in different tanks is a multivariable problem. And uh, just another application. So robots, furnaces, and some machines, you know, with uh, you know, controlling the speed and the, and the tension of the paper in special machines for industry. This is also for industry with several robots. There are several applications that we have been doing in the, in the past. And in particular, uh, uh, just to finish, you know, some ideas about uh, uh, the wind energy area, the wind energy uh, um, uh, application. So this is one of the very first wind turbines that I was involved. Uh, I started in this particular project about 15 years ago. Now it's working this particular machine in many different places. This is uh, 1.6 megawatts. Uh, this area is bigger than a football pitch, so it's amazing. And we are uh, dealing with, uh, with uh, torques that more than 1 million uh, uh, newton meter, for example, is, uh, is, uh, is a huge torque. And uh, you know, 1.65 megawatts is a lot. Um, uh, this is just uh, some different uh, technologies, uh, but for that particular one, it's, it's a direct drive, multiple synchronous generator with a full power converter. That means that uh, we have not gearbox in this particular application, and we have to control many things like the pitch angle here, the rotor speed. We have to control the yaw, you know, following the, the direction of the wind. We have to control the excitation that we are introducing in, in the generator. We have to control here uh, this current that is uh, at the end is the torque that we are putting, you know, against the torque of the wind, the mechanical torque. We have to control, you know, the, the power factor here or some voltages or the power factor here in the, in the grid and things like that. So it's a, we have to control many different things in order to improve the efficiency of the system, the reliability, in order to improve the quality of the electricity that we are producing. So there are many things behind. It's a very non-linear problem because of the aerodynamic part. But we are you know, dealing with everything, with the aerodynamics, with uh, mechanics, because we have flexible modes. We are dealing with uh, uh, electronic and electrical problems. And in the end, we are designing the controller to deal with everything, you know, to, to, to have the machine working along. Uh, this is just one picture about you know, power and wind. So depending on the, on the wind speed, we are in a different situation, you know, going up with this equation, and then you know, keeping the power here constant. So depending on the area, we have to improve efficiency here, or we have to deal with very, very big uh, torques and power here, you know, moving the pitch, things like that. Or, or we have to deal with the storms here, so this is a very special area, quite complex to control as well. This is just one example of that particular machine. You can see here the pitch. So we are moving three independent motors. We are moving every blade. It's a direct drive, so this is not gearbox. And this is the generator, and this is the jaw, and then we have the full power converter in the, 
in the bottom. This is just one picture about that man, that particular machine. Well, some papers, we have no time right now for the papers, but you know, when we are you know, doing the master or the PhD, it's important you know, to write papers, and there is a lot of material here for that. This is just uh, some pictures about you know, the generators and things like that. You can see how big is this machine. You can see here people with the blades, you know. And this was uh, made, it was eight years ago. You know, that was the first prototype of uh, this particular machine. You can see here some more pictures about this first prototype. Now there are many working like that. And just to finish, uh, some other research activities in this area. Uh, and we are interested, interested in uh, advanced control systems for improving the efficiency you know, of the machines and improving the reliability. So that uh, depends on the control strategy, the control algorithm. We have you know, um, different behaviors, uh, uh, mathematical models, very nonlinear of the machine. And the machine has to be you know, working in the middle of nowhere with the wind, with the, uh, maybe with the storms, with the grid that is going up and down. And we have to work with that. It's very important also for us, and we are interested in health monitoring techniques for wind turbines. Um, we have a, a new project right now about new blades, uh, new, um, with new concepts in order uh, to improve or to reduce the uh, load. You know, so it's for uh, load attenuation, including new sensors and, uh, and new control strategies. Because this is a very, very big topic right now. If uh, we are improving or in growing the size of the machines, we are now thinking in three megawatts, for example, is so big that the key point is how to attenuate the load, how to reduce the mechanical load, the mechanical fatigue. And this is related to control as well. So we are also interested in the increased integration. When a machine uh, is working in the grid, you have many things in the grid. You have voltage dips, for example, or maybe you know the voltage is you know going down, and you have to to help the grid operator, you know, to to control the voltage or to control the frequency. We can do that with the wind turbines. So this is a very new area and very important because uh, until now the grid operators are looking at the windmills like a system that is a problem. But it's not a problem. It has to be you know, something to help also the grid. So this is a very important topic. And finally, you know, we are also very interested in offshore wind technology. You know that uh, now all the um, wind energy already installed in the world is about 100 gigawatts. The five Great Lakes, the potential wind energy that we have in the five Great Lakes is about 250. So it's 2.5 times the, the wind energy that we have right now in the world. Just like Lake Erie, 68 gigawatts. So the potential is amazing. And we are very interested in, in, in offshore. That means, you know, um, we can create a new market, a new sector, you know, a new economy based on wind energy here in Cleveland, in Ohio, you know, in, in this area. So that is a very, very hot, hot topic here. And we have to do many things. We have to work with new foundations. We have to work with a, a new control system, you know, to control the, uh, the machine, you know, taking into account currents. Uh, and uh, you know water currents at the same time as uh, uh, the wind, and also you know taking into account that this structure is different, so you have uh, different flexible modes. You can have ice, and then you are changing the flexible modes because of the ice, things like that. So there are many things to be done here in this area as well. Well, this is uh, I think this is the last uh, picture. So I know you have any question. Um, so if you have interest in this area, I will be very happy, uh, you know, answering any question now or in my office is uh, all in 6.05. So do you have any question? Yeah, let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Um, questions from the audience? And, and perhaps Dr. Lewicki can start setting up while we're taking questions. 
Um, I have a question. I, yes. Um, I know that you've been working hard to help work out a deal to set up some windmills in Lake Erie. Can, can you tell us where that stands? Well, you know, the, the main problem here in, uh, in Ohio, uh, in the U.S. in general, for offshore wind energy is that there, there are not regulations. So it's, uh, we have to work in the, also, you know, to help uh, uh, writing new regulations for that because it's a very new topic, you know, to put, you know, a new structure in the middle of the lake. So this is a, this is a particular thing. And, uh, on the other hand, there are also technical issues like uh, ice in the, you know, in the in the windmill, in the in the foundation that we have to solve, and uh, how to connect the system, you know, from offshore to onshore. So there are things around, you know, technical things and uh, also regulations things. And there is another problem that is uh, related to the birds and bats and things like that, you know, natural resources that the, you know the, the government is right now studying. But, uh, you know, this big project is going on. Probably, I guess that in a couple of years, we will see the first wind turbines in the lake. And, you know, there is a huge potential, you know, behind, behind the lake in terms of new jobs and new uh, possibilities for everyone. And this, are, this is a very hot topic in any place in the world. The good thing of Lake Erie is that it's very shallow and it's fresh water. So this is the best place to start with offshore and uh, wind energy. It's much uh, easier than the North Sea or places like that, or New York or California. This is uh, the right place to start. Yeah. More questions? All right, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Well, uh, I'll, while our, our next speaker is getting set up, I'll, I'll make a quick advertisement. Thank you. Um, our, uh, I'm gonna start passing. I'll start passing this around. Um, please leave it in the in the back. After the last person. Um, our school's making and uh, and our university is making a big push to do more in energy, and EECS has much to contribute. Um, over the last few years, we've created new courses in electrical distribution with Dr. Umans. Um, the new course in motors and generators being taught this semester by Pete Svitsi. And um, look for a new course in the spring in the area of power electronics. Um, so we're, we're, in addition to that, uh, Dr. Libertori in our computer science faculty has been learning about power informatics, how to manage loads and sources in order to operate the grid at peak efficiency. So uh, look for these things when you're thinking about courses. Um, our next speaker is uh, Professor Michael Lewicki. He's an associate professor in our CS program. He's joining us from Carnegie Mellon University just this summer. He has interests that cross boundaries in our department, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing about them. Thank you. How do I get the list? Oh, I think uh, maybe this button works the best. Okay. Yeah, thank you. It's nice to be here. I'm just moving in, still getting settled. Um, the main focus of my research uh, is the perception of natural auditory and visual scenes. And the problem that we're interested in is when we look at something like this, you know, there's just a lot going on, all kinds of complex objects. And if you look sort of at the history of computer vision and also audition, um, what people have done is try and simplify the problem, sort of make very control environments. And what we haven't really understood is how we can process natural images like this, complex scenes. And what we've been trying to do is understand the computational principles that allow both biological organisms, including ourselves, to be able to process something like this. So my goal today is just to give you an overview of the kinds of things we've done and some idea of, the where, of where we're going. And basically it falls into these parts. There are natural images, um, also natural sound. We're sort of interested in general algorithms. So one nice thing about that is it allows us to apply these general algorithms to both images and sounds. And what that also means is that we can go into other domains too that um, 
we might not have any in intuitions about. So if we understand the principles that um, allow us to construct all this structure that's out there in the world that's given to us by our senses, then we can put in other sensors and try and get the same level of sophistication that um, our own perceptual systems give us. So when you look at the brain, um, another thing that we're interested in is not just um, sort of the algorithms, but the algorithms as a theoretical prediction. What, when we look at something like the brain, it's incredibly complex, and we don't understand all the information that it, information processing that it does. And one of the only ways we can really get a handle on it is to try and make theoretical predictions. And what we try and do is follow the flow of information as it goes through the eye and the retina up the optic nerve and into the areas of visual cortex. And if we can understand sort of the fundamental information processing principles that are going on there, then we should be able to take the same kinds of um, images or sounds and predict the kinds of representations and the kinds of information processing that you would see at, at each stage. And this is a different approach than you might see in, say, artificial intelligence, robotics, or computer vision, because it's really focused on science. It's trying to make a theoretical prediction about the way things are in nature. So we can have um, testable theories, and we can falsify them. We're not just interested in an algorithm that works. We're interested in understanding what's going on here so that we understand <coughs> what organisms do. So one of the problems you run into is, so how should you describe the world? And traditionally, people have described the visual images in terms of edges. You detect features at different places. And that works fairly well. And it seems to be what the brain is doing. But what kind of um, principle would tell you that edges are the best representation to use? There's all kinds of representations that you could use. And if you look at any natural image, one thing you realize is that edges don't often exist the way you think you do. We really construct the world out of our senses. It's, it's all created, in a sense, by a perceptual system. Because if you look at the edge of the log there against the rocks, the actual edge kind of disappears. You have to infer that it's there. The same with this edge. The actual edge, as you would describe that contour, is here, but then there's sort of a false edge from the shadow of the rocks above. And here you can kind of see it a little better, but it's really not defined in a way that's, that you might expect a detector, an edge detector to work. It's really a subtle texture boundary that has to be inferred from all of this contextual information. And what you also see from this is that, well, edges might define sort of sharp contrast like this, but what about all this stuff in the middle? How is the brain representing that kind of structure? So one problem we want to solve is, or we could pose, is if we wanted to figure out the optimal way to represent structure of natural images, we could ask the question, what's the best representation? And what we can do now is use optimization algorithms and machine learning to derive that representation for us. And we can prove that it's optimal in an information processing sense, in the sense that it takes the least amount of bits, for example, to describe an image to a certain level of precision. And so what you do in this approach is you can take a, um, a filter bank or a set of features, and they initially just start as random features. And you search through the whole space of possible features until you arrive at one that's optimal for the data that you're interested in, in this case, natural images. And so this gives you your computational solution to this problem. What's the best way to rep represent images? And it turns out that that solution, um, here is a, the set of filters that you see. And if you're an engineer, you might recognize these as Kapoor filters. Um, but basically, they take localized areas of contrast. So unlike um, the approach we did before, where we just assumed that edges were a good thing, the theory here told us that this was the best way not just to represent contours, but all natural images. So whether representing the texture of the rock or the, the structure of the bark or the contrast between the two, this is the best way to encode a generic natural image. And what's very interesting for us is that this also makes um, a prediction. And this is, in, in our field, 
this is really one of the first major theoretical results where you could go from a theoretical prediction and make an accurate prediction about what was going on in the visual system. And in this case, the kinds of um, feature detectors they found are very similar to what they've measured in visual cortex. And so you can compare them directly. This is a sort of a model of a, a receptive field, a model of the, the filter. So here's the um, positive area, this is the negative area. And this would be described as an edge detector. And so you can predict the whole set of edge detectors from the simple idea of finding an efficient representation of natural images. So one thing we were interested in when I was starting a monthly group before is how general is this theory? Can we apply it to other domains? Because if it's a general theory of information processing, we should be able to go in to any domain, really, and predict the, the best representation. So one of the things we were interested in is natural sounds. And the first thing you have to do is come up with a representation that's efficient. Because the whole goal here is to describe the sound in as compact a way as possible. Now, of course, with things like the iPod, encoding digital media is a very active area. But it turns out that's um, a representation that's not as efficient, as efficient as it could be. It's really constructed more for mathematical convenience and sort of implementation in digital signal processing than it is from the viewpoint of statistical optimality. And we can do much better if we make our code much more flexible. And so here's a code that allows us to be very flexible in terms of how we describe structure in acoustic signals. And the basic idea is that we have a set of features. These are acoustic features now, and these are the waveforms. And all we do is describe the, the feature, its amplitude, and its position in time. And so this is in contrast from the typical block code, where you would just divide up the signal, take each vector in the block, and, and transform it using a Fourier or wave of or something like that. This is a nonlinear code, because what you have to decide when you encode a sequence, an audio sequence like this, is the, p the positions and amplitude of all of these different features. And the positions can be anywhere, and they're accurate down to a single sample. So you can determine very precisely where the oscillations and modulations are in the waveform. And they can repeat. Um, here they're describing, this is actually a segment of speech, and you can see the harmonic structure in the speech. And this is the optimal code. And if you take this code, um, add up all of these different features at their appropriate time positions with the appropriate weighting, you can reconstruct the original signal to arbitrary accuracy. But what we can do now with the theory is ask the question, like what we did before, is what's the best set of features? Since we can, divide, we can make optimization algorithms that will search through the whole space of possible features, if we made it as best as it can be for natural sounds or speech, whatever we're interested in, what would that be? So here's a picture of that happening. So we start the features from just random features. And then what we're going to do in this case is adapt them to speech. And you can see them kind of grow and change. And we also adapt the length. Right? There's no blocking here. So we can make them as short or as long as we want. And what you can see down here is that the signal to noise ratio, or the fidelity that we're representing the signal with, will go steadily up. And the entropy of our code which is represented over here, goes steadily down. And these features kind of adapt to representing little wavelet-like structures. So these asymmetrical things with a, a sharp onset and, and gradual decay. And when we're done adapting this, we get a set of features that looks like this. So this represents the scale bar. And you can see that some are very short like that one, but others are very long. And the whole range spans between something like five milliseconds at the shortest, all the way up to hundreds of milliseconds for the longest. And this, again, makes a theoretical prediction. So here what we're doing is we're saying that what we think evolution has done in the case of mammalian auditory systems is adapted our auditory code so that it best represents sounds in the environment. And what evolution does is adapt the auditory nerve filter shapes, adapts the number and the population and how they tile that space. And what we can do with our theory is try and do the same thing. If we match sort of this underlying theory, then we should be able to predict properties of this code 
and also optimize the coding efficiency. But importantly, we only compare back to what we know from the biology after we've made this prediction. And it turns out that once we do make this comparison, here's a slide that shows the learned kernels overlaid on um, auditory factors they <coughs> measured in the cat, and they fit almost perfectly. And so all we did here was ask the question, what are the best set of features for natural sounds? And this is the answer, and it turns out to be almost exactly the same as what you measure in the cat. Now there's an interesting um, observation that came out of this, because it's, it's sort of a weird disconnection, because we also get these same set of features for speech, human speech. And you might wonder, well, why would human speech match the code that you see in the cat auditory system? But another way to think about it is that, well, the auditory system has been evolving for a very long time. Mammals are 50, 60 million years old, so it's been around for a long time. And maybe it's not the auditory system that's adapting, it's speech that it's adapting. So another way to look at it is if you want to have a vocal communication system that pushes the maximum amount of information through your auditory system, it should have properties of natural sounds, sounds in the environment. And it turns out that speech has this same set of properties. We have vowels, which are representative of animal vocalizations. We have consonants, which are divided into two classes. There's the siblings, you know, like shh, and that, things like that. And, and the harder consonants, like ga and ka. And those are very similar to sounds in the natural environment that are important for sound localization. So animals need to know where other animals are. And the cues that you use for that are like rustling in the ears and sort of hard sounds like cracking twigs. So those are very important sounds in the environment. And our auditory system was already adapted for those for a very long time. And so it seems like speech came along afterward. And this seems to be consistent with that notion. So let's go back to the, the visual system. And another thing we try to do is make more detailed predictions. So we try and abstract as much as we can, but we also want to be as detailed as we can. So part of what we do is to try and dive down into more detail. And in the other direction, which I'll show you about in a minute, is to sort of get more abstract. So if you know something about the brain, you may have been wondering that what we seem to have done in, in the first stage is we predict the kinds of features, these little edge detectors, and that kind of matches what's going on in visual cortex, which is at the bottom of the, the back of the brain. But we seem to have skipped the whole retina. And if you know something about the retina, you know that there's a lot of computation that goes on. The retinal circuitry is very complex. So what's going on there? And also it has very different um, receptive field properties. They tend to detect dots of light, center um, center surround structure where you have bright in the middle and dark on the outside. So it's clear that the theory doesn't predict this correctly, so it, it must be inaccurate. And one thing we want to do is refine it. Either understand a, a, a better way to do the optimization or maybe something that we've missed. And it turns out there's a lot of, of properties that um, the conventional theory doesn't describe. First of all, images are very noisy and they're blurred because of the imperfection in the optics. The neural population changes size quite dramatically. You know that in the center of your vision, you have very sharp vision, and that's because you have a lot of um, cells devoted to representing the information in, in the center area. But when you go correctly, biology doesn't want to have, it can't fit so many cells, so it, it just sort of spreads them out. You have very low resolution in the periphery. And what that means is that the code is going to change as you go from the center to the periphery. And one question is, well, how do you make optimal use with varying numbers of neurons? And a more important problem is that in the brain, neurons are very noisy. So in the conventional models, um, neural activity was sort of represented just by a floating point number in a simulation. And that makes the implicit assumption that you have a lot of precision at um, in a single neuron, but any one neuron in the brain or any real system is noisy. There's only so much precision and, and neurons are very noisy. So the question is, how do you make a code that's robust? We have the sensory input 
And if we model accurately the level of noise in a neural population, we can add, we can make, it's about one bit of precision per neural event. And if we try and code with um, the code we had before using one bit of neural precision, we get a mess. Um, when you reconstruct it, it's 34% error. So all of the information that we very carefully coded is lost. And one thing we want to be able to solve is, well, we should be able to design a code that's robust to that kind of noise. And we can take the same number of neurons, the same level of noise, but just optimize the features that we use. We'll add redundancy. And when we do that, we can reduce the error by a factor of 10, go from 34 down to just 3.8% error, just by using a different code. And it turns out we can get it arbitrarily low um, if we simply add more neurons. So now this allows us to do a lot. We can vary the number of neurons, we can vary the level of noise, and all a bunch of different parameters to actually match the conditions at the retina. And when we do that, now we can predict fairly accurately the way that the retinal code changes, for example, for different light levels, the cell receptive fields actually change shape. And we can also predict how it changes when you go from the center of vision out to the periphery, when you have far fewer cells. And in every case, the retina seems to be doing the optimal thing, coding robustly. So the last thing I want to tell you about is, can we go beyond this sensory coding? Can we sort of get up higher toward the more cognitive level? And I want to tell you sort of briefly about the kinds of problems you face at this level. So this is, um, we've seen what happens in the retina and what happens in the V1. But now, when you go up to the higher level, what do you do? What's the problem that the brain solves? So when we, are, we approach this is that when you look at a complex scene, at some level you have to start to put it together in terms of objects and surfaces and, and different regions. But the problem you face is that there's a lot of variability. And if you imagine yourself looking around at the scene, when you look at that tree bark, for example, with the, the blue arc, each picture of that bark is very different from the other. But how do you know that they're all the same? How do you know that they all represent bark and that they're all represented at the surface of that tree. Another problem is, is, are these edges. Remember, we're very good at detecting edges and contours, but the actual image is changing a lot as you go from the, the edge down here, which is defined by the texture of the bark on this side and the texture of the foliage on the other side. And yet, the contour for us is the same as that changes all the way up the bark. So this is a problem of perceptual generalization. When we look at these two patterns, there's, a, there's some level that we have to call these two things the same. And we can make statistical models that will solve that problem for us. So if we had a model that described all the variability, and we could recognize an instance of, a, of one of these classes, um, like bar, then we would be able to solve this problem. So the conjecture is that two images are similar if they come from the same statistical distribution. And so if you look at, at these bark areas, this is different from that on a sort of pixel by pixel basis, but they're still part of the same distribution of contours. And one way to see this is, is that if you look at any given patch, if you look at different features of the edge, they, they form a distribution. But they have characteristics that we can identify. And the idea here, which I don't have time to go into, but rather than coding the actual image, we're going to generalize. We're going to code the distribution that they came from so that all of these points, no matter what instance they represent, you abstract from that and code the density that they came from. So they would all get mapped into the same representation. And so we can look at what happens to the representation as we go sort of higher up in the system. If you look at the pixels and, and take samples from these different regions, everything gets mixed together. There's no way to distinguish them. If you look at different features, they're also mixed together. But now if you abstract and try and identify the underlying structure, the representation, which is 150 dimensional, but we project it down into 2D to just look for areas where it's separated, all separates out beautifully. So that tree bark up there all of the instances of the images 
get mapped to this part of the representation space. So they're all together, but they're all distinct from the red, which is that, that tree mark. So anywhere you look along that edge gets mapped up to this part of the space. So all those things in the model are similar now, and yet they remain distinct from what visually is very, or what in terms of the image pixels are very similar. And you can make a map of sort of how it sees things at this more abstract level. And you can see that the bark is very similar, the edges are very similar. And what we can do with that is look at complex images now and start to put it together into more, sort of more abstract parts, like surfaces. So even though the, the orientation of that grain and the bark and the color and everything are changing, to the model at that abstract level, it's all the same. So to summarize, um, I think that top button. Yeah. So to summarize, um, the main points is that what we're trying to do in the lab is understand these underlying computational principles, and we apply them to a wide range of areas. We're now interested in sort of natural auditory scenes and ambient soundscapes, how you localize sounds, how you deal with room acoustics, problems of that nature. I think that'll be very important for things like oral prosthetics and hearing aids, um, speech recognition in complex environments, things like that. Um, generalization of natural scenes, we're very interested in how you process natural scenes, understand the orientation of surfaces um, for basically putting things together. And in addition to all these computational problems, we're very interested in the scientific problems too. Can we make predictions about what's going on in biology? And the reason this is important is because biology has already solved these problems. And still, as engineers, we, we don't know how to solve a lot of these real world problems when you go out and deal with complex natural scenes. And one of my beliefs is that biology can tell us a lot about how to solve that problem and what problems you need to solve. Okay, so I'll end there, and while um, our next speaker is setting up, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Let's, let's thank Dr. Lee. Questions for Dr. Lewerke? No, sorry. Uh, we have one. So, for the multi-dimensional space that you do, short on time. Our final speaker today is Dr. Mark Allman. He's actually been been with us uh, for several years, so you can't exactly tell him new, but I think most of us are not aware of his work, and this was a good opportunity to learn about it. Um, so this isn't...
Dr. Allman is, a, is a, a member of our adjunct faculty in computer science, and if your laptop doesn't start working soon, you might just want to... No, I'm just going to... Uh, it's a pity because I have plots. Um, Other than rebooting, I don't know what to suggest. Yeah, really, I don't. Um, but but there, there's not a lot of time anyway. It's, um, I'm going to try to plug this in one more time. But um, So... My uh, my research, like uh, like you said, I, I'm a adjunct faculty. My primary appointment is um, with a little uh, research institute. Uh, it's actually in Berkeley, California, called the International Computer Science Institute. Is it doing something? Maybe. Um, and uh, the, the the institute is uh, involved in a variety of things. But I work in the networking group. Um, I had some very uh, interesting, I think, plots to show you, but uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mess with that anymore. Um, and we don't have much time anyway. Uh, let's see. Um, can I write? Can you make that go up? Um, oh, very good. Uh, so, so I work in in two two main areas. Uh, the first area is thinking about. Um, network architecture and uh, network architecture is generally the way we sort of organize networks, the abstractions we use um, and the other area is in uh, measurement and I had some you know cool plots of spam and uh, all sorts of things to show you here um, maybe another time. Uh, what we do is we try to understand the, uh, the network, how it works, uh, why it works that way um, we keep making these observations sort of over and over again that these models that we've developed in our head from, you know, taking networking classes and, um, you know, our sort of own experiences setting up our networks and whatever, um, essentially give us zero understanding of how the network really works. Um, and uh, there, there's a nice plot here that, that shows sort of uh, topology. We, we thought that topology looked a particular way in, in 2002, and there was about... Um, four dozen routers on this one picture. And it turns out in 2008, we boiled that down to it's actually about 12. And um, that 12 is actually, if you go and survey, you know, and actually physically look at what's going on, that's about right. Um, but, it, but in 2002, our sort of inference was lousy enough that, that we got it four times wrong, basically. Um, and there are people getting it even more wrong, these sort of network scientists who think they're routers with like a thousand wires coming out of them. Um, they don't exist on this planet. Um, but it doesn't stop them from, you know, doing all this theory about it. So, so we're really sort of focused on learning about the network by, you know, trying to do sound measurement about it. Um, and, you know, other than, than some, some cool plots, that was sort of the message. Um, I am in, uh, I'm over in Olin, I'm going to write my email address here, I'm always looking to work with students, um, in, in whatever capacity, TCs, undergrad, senior project, whatever, um, so let's see, I'm in uh, Olin, 610, I believe, um, it, my name's on the door, uh, <laughs> I know where it's at. Yeah. Um, and, and the other thing that was on a slide is that uh, the networking group here, which is um, Professor Jin and uh, Professor Rabinovich and Professor Liberatori um, and, and a bunch of uh, you know, interesting students, uh, we're, we get together once a week um, to chat about a paper from uh, you know, sort of we, not about any particular topic, but we sort of rotate around a lot. Um, and so let's see the and anybody's welcome. There's a there's a mailing list to announce these things. Send me an email. I'll put you on the list. Um, this semester Friday at uh, two o'clock over in Norwood. Um And anybody's welcome. Um, the general prerequisite for this is that you bring an opinion, and that's it. It doesn't matter what that opinion is. Um, in fact, the uh, more outlandish, the better, usually. So, um, I'm 
a little bit bummed that I can't show you some plots, but uh, you guys probably aren't, so. <laughs> Perhaps right. I have another chance to do this this semester. Sure. Thank you. Yep. Um, any questions for Dr. Allman? Okay. Um, before you leave, please make sure the clipboard's back there somewhere. I can find it. Also, I think our refreshments got here a bit late, but I think they're probably outside in the hallway now if you'd like to grab some. Um, all right, thank you for coming. I'm going to mess with it for another minute because I think it's my laptop that's all screwed up. Yeah, I want to solve this.